concluded. Are questions without notice? Are there any questions? Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Small Business. Minister, under Labor's radical industrial relations agenda, which the Minister has confirmed not a single small business in this country supports, a coffee shop with less than 15 employees is exempt from compulsory bargaining. If that small business operates over three sites with seven employees at each, can that small business be compelled into multi-employer bargaining? Give a call to the Minister for Small Business, Minister for Housing and Minister for Homelessness. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank uh, the Minister, Shadow Minister over there for her question. As I've said in this place, uh, we are continuing to consult and talk to small businesses as we negotiate Members through on my getting left. this industrial relations on bill my through to the parliament. Uh, when it comes to the size of small businesses, you would have seen the recommendations, of course, from the Senate committee yesterday, and we're having a look at those, and we are actually talking to people about what they might mean. Indeed, as she would also know if she's read the bill, there are several thresholds that need to be met for the single interest bargaining stream. One of them is the number of employees. Of course, the others are that the Fair Work Commission needs to be satisfied that employers have a clearly identified common interest and that the bargain is not contrary to the public interest. Right. That threshold needs to be met. Oh, we uh, want to see businesses competing on quality, will, on innovation, on product pause. and service. And I give the call to the Deputy Leader of the Opposition and I'd ask her to state very clearly what the point of order is. Relevance because of the tightness of the question, Mr Speaker. If there were three sites with seven employees... Resume your seat. Three... Yep, resume your seat. The... the Minister is being directly relevant. It had about four parts to the question. It was a complicated and detailed question. The minister is answering the question. I'll give her the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And if the shadow minister would listen carefully, there are actually thresholds that need to be met. It's not just the number of employees, right? It needs to be also that they need to want to bargain the employees. Seriously. Either side of the bargaining order. table order. can opt in. The deputy leader right? of the opposition the has asked her question. Or the majority of employees. So they need to meet several thresholds to actually be in this interest stream of bargaining. She needs to understand it is not as straightforward as she wants the member to say for Page will cease over there. She also needs to understand, as I've said clearly in this place, over two million small businesses on my left will, will be cease unaffected interjecting. by this single interest bargaining stream. Over two million, 90 per cent of all businesses. And the show the minister over there has been out trying to whip up conflict and confusion about this, right? And she needs to be careful, Mr Speaker. Order. Members on my left will cease interjecting. There is far too much noise. I cannot hear. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition was heard in silence. The member for Page, when the House comes to order, the minister will continue. Thank you. The Shadow Minister said this morning that the whole bill is terrible. Does she really think, as a Shadow Minister for Women, that acting on sexual harassment in the workplace is terrible? Is that what she really thinks? Does she really think closing the gender pay gap is terrible? Is that what she really thinks? Does she Order. really think that making adjustments to the better off overall test that businesses have asked for is terrible? Is that what she really thinks? Small businesses actually deserve better than what the Shadow Minister is giving them. Give a call to the member for Hawke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Early Childhood Education. Why are Labor's early childhood education reforms important to the economy? Give the call to the Minister for Early Childhood Education and the Minister for Youth. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the outstanding member for, for Hawke for his question. The member for Hawke is a parent to three young children, and I understand the youngest is just 10 weeks old. And as a parent, I know that he understands full well those first five years, just how critical they are to a child's development. But let me say, Speaker, what an incredible day it is to be on this side of the House. Yeah. Two years ago, our Prime Minister stood firm 
on our commitment to families and children to make early childhood education more affordable. We took our commitments to the election, and, Speaker, today we made it a reality. Yeah. Today we delivered. And from July next year, over 1.2 million families right across Australia will be better off because of our reforms, right. not only reducing the cost of early learning, but also allowing primary caregivers, primarily women, the opportunity to make the choice to return to work, to take on additional hours or to further their study, as I did. Our policy will unlock up to 37,000 full-time paid workers for our economy in the first year alone. No longer will parents lose between 80 to 100 per cent of their take-home pay simply for working a fourth or a fifth day. That's money back into their pockets, money back into household budgets and money back into the economy. And what a stark contrast, what a stark contrast to those opposite who allowed fees for centre-based care to increase by a whopping 41 per cent under their watch, putting early childhood education out of reach for many families. Oh, it's the League of Unextraordinary Men standing up. Order. The, the <laughs> minister will resume her seat. Members on my right. And I give order. I give the call to the manager of opposition business. Yes, Mr. Speaker. On relevance, was a tightly drafted question. Uh, you have, in previous question times, directed a minister back to the question when the minister is straight into the record of the previous government. There was no reference to the previous. Resume government. your seat. The minister will turn back to the question. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The question was about why our reforms are important to the economy, and it is quite relevant to point out that for household budgets, a 41 per cent increase in the cost of early childhood education does impact on their budgets, and it does impact on the economy. And that is why our reforms are important to the economy, Mr Speaker. This policy is game-changing game changing for the economy. It will impact two generations at the same time, boosting productivity, participation in work and ensuring that our children get the highest quality early childhood education that they deserve. Our government values children. We value women's workforce. We value women's workforce participation. And we have worked from day one, day one, to make this massive economic form a reality. We will never, we will never be deterred never by negativity from those opposite. We'll continue on the path of making early childhood education more affordable and accessible. It is indeed, Mr Speaker, a great day to be on this side of the House. Yeah. Give the call to the member for Moncrief. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Small Business. Uh, Minister, under the IR legislation, a coffee shop with less than 15 employees is exempt from compulsory bargaining. If a coffee shop operates over three sites with seven employees at each, will they be forced into multi-employer bargaining? I give, the, I, I give the call to the Minister for Small Business, Minister for Housing and the Minister for Homelessness. Now, the Leader of the Opposition, the leader of the opposition will... It's not on. Well, the minister hasn't begun her answer. I'm not sure why you're complaining about it. I certainly can. Order. As I did before. The minister I will res can. Min I want to be clear on this. The member of Moncrief was heard in silence when she asked her question. It is completely disrespectful to any minister, before they've even begun speaking, to be yelling at them. I'll give the call to the minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I said very clearly, there are thresholds that need to be met. The single employer needs to have the businesses of the number of threshold of employees. We are currently negotiating and discussing, given the Senate recommendations, on that number of employees. We've also said that either side of the bargaining table can opt in to the single interest bargaining stream: the employer by consent or the employees by majority support. 
They also need to meet the test whereby the Fair Work Commission needs to be satisfied that the employers have clearly identified common interests and the bargaining is not contrary to the public interest. So there are several thresholds that need to be met. The employee number, as you would know from the recommendations from the Senate, there is another number that has been proposed and we're currently in negotiation, negotiations and discussing that. But let's be very clear, over two million small businesses in Australia will be exempt Minister, from these provisions. Will you resume her seat? Has she concluded her answer? The Minister's concluded her answer. Order. The, the member for Paterson will cease interjecting. I give the call to the member for Jagger Jagger. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. How will the government's cheaper childcare legislation help Australian families? I give the call to the Prime Minister. I thank the member for her question. Indeed, I join with the Minister for declaring this a great day that the Parliament has passed our childcare reforms. Uh, this was a commitment that I gave when budget replies had major policies as the centrepiece, and this was the centrepiece of the first budget reply that I had the honour to give on behalf of this side of the House. Because childcare reform is economic reform. It boosts productivity, it boosts workforce participation, but it is also positive uh, for uh, our youngest Australians. And in recent weeks, I've had the opportunity uh, to visit childcare centres across the country. The Avenue Child Children's Centre in Kindergarten in Balaclava, in uh, the member for McNamara's seat in Melbourne. Good Start Early Learning in Summerton Park in South Australia. Baringa Childcare Centre in Queensland. Good Start Early Learning in Kalamunda in Western Australia. And Crestwood World of Learning in Queanbeyan and ACT. Everywhere I've met, we have been, had positive feedback from the early learning educators, but also from parents. Uh, this is what uh, Louise said, who's the president of the Avenue Children's Centre, about her son, where her son Jack goes. As a working mum, the cheaper childcare bill is a really welcome change. Anything that assists our family budget is very much appreciated. I think not only of my family, but how this legislation will benefit across our society, especially for other working women. It's a really progressive move and a long time coming. Georgie Dent I pay tribute to for her work from the parenthood. Uh, she welcomed me into her home to meet with parents who needed the government to act. She told me that with her daughter, we were spending more, more on early childhood care than we were spending on rent at the time. Another mother who was there, Delene Jacobides, said, at the moment our kids are doing two days at one centre and two days at another. The cost is well above a mortgage. I'm really passionate about this. As a financial advisor, I know that childcare costs directly impact women. Mr Speaker, so many parents who you meet around the country say they're relieved when their child reaches the age of five and goes to school because all of a sudden their family income is much better off because they're not paying childcare fees. Why is it that in this country we regard there being a difference between a three-year-old, a four-year-old or a five-year-old in terms of the family budget. This is a practical move, a practical move which would be followed, will be followed by the Productivity Commission having a look at the universality of childcare at provision being made affordable across the board, which would be the logical next step of what's an important reform for this country. Yeah. The call to the honourable member for McKellar. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is for the Attorney-General. The persecution and prosecution of whistleblowers in recent years is a national shame. Today, Griffith University, the Human Rights Law Centre and Transparency International have re released a report outlining 12 key steps Australia must take to strengthen whistleblower protections. Will the government commit to implementing the report's recommendations in this term of parliament, in particular the establishment of the Whistleblower Protection Authority? Give the call to the Attorney General. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for McKellar for her question. Uh, I've received a copy of the joint report uh, on whistleblowers by Griffith University, the Human Rights Law Centre, and Transparency International, uh, and I know of the member's long-standing interest in this area. 
The report uh, sets out a number of areas of whistleblower reform. It will be considered by the government along with other reviews and reports on this important topic. Uh, I have previously indicated pretty clearly that the Albanese government is going to deliver long overdue reforms to the Public Interest Disclosure Act to ensure that Australia has best practice whistleblowing protection for the public sector. Next week I will be introducing to the parliament a bill which will implement the key recommendations and this is long overdue of the 2016 review of the Public Interest Disclosure Act that was carried out by an eminent Australian public servant, Mr Philip Moss AM. Uh, it will also be implementing some parliamentary committee reports which have looked at the operation of the Public Interest Disclosure Act since we brought it to the parliament when we were last in government in 2013. The bill that I'm introducing next week will deliver some immediate improvements to the public sector whistleblowing, sch whistleblowing scheme. It will be in place before the National Anti-Corruption Commission commences, as we hope, in mid-2023. And this bill will represent the first stage of a significant package of public sector whistleblowing reform. Following the passage of that bill, this first bill, the government will commence a second stage of further and broader refor reforms to the Public Interest Disclosure Act, which will include an exposure draft process, a discussion paper on whether there is a need to establish a whistleblower protection authority or, as some of your crossbench colleagues have suggested, a whistleblower protection commissioner. Uh, the bill that is going to be introduced next week and the Albanese government's broader reform package reinforces our strong commitment to restoring integrity in government and the rule of law. Before I call the member from Cunningham, I would like to acknowledge Mr Damien Hale, who is in the gallery today, a former member for Solomon. A very warm welcome. Give a call to the member for Cunningham. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Social Services. How is the Albanese Labor government helping pensioners address cost of living pressures during these uncertain economic times? Good Give a call to the Minister for Social Services. Excellent. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for Cunningham for uh, her question, but also for her advocacy for seniors in her electorate. Uh, she is a tireless advocate for seniors and many others in her electorate. But the government uh, is deeply committed to addressing cost of living pressures for older Australians and giving them more flexibility in how they choose to support themselves in retirement. We have already delivered on a number of key election promises, including to freeze the deeming rates for two years and, of course, to expand the access Member to the Barth Commonwealth Health ejected. Seniors Card to, a, uh, to approximately 52,000 seniors. And seniors today are now benefiting from the flow-on effects that that seniors card is having. Of course, if all Member going Barker well in the Senate, pen pensioners will not be penalised for downsizing their house by getting more favourable deeming rates and ensuring that the cost of that uh, downsizing is not included in the assets test. But of course, we are also making it easier for pensioners to work if they choose to do so. Last night, the parliament passed the bill that is di designed to strengthen incentives for pensioners over the age pension age to take up work. And I would like to thank parliamentarians across the aisle, across this parliament, for constructively engaging on this issue. And I'd also like to acknowledge the National Seniors Association for their strong advocacy. The new legislation means that from 1 December 2022 to 31 December 2023, pensioners over age pension age will be able to earn an extra $4,000 without losing any pension. Importantly, they will be able to choose when they take this additional work over the year. Pensioners do not need to do anything. The top-up to their work bonus will automatically be credited to their income bank on 1 December. Around 51,000 pensioners already participating in the workforce will benefit from these increases immediately, and we look forward to more pensioners taking up this opportunity, because we know if there is an increase in the number of older Australians in work, this will not only benefit them, but will benefit businesses who, in many cases, are struggling to meet workforce shortages. 
Supporting older Australians uh, to get into work was one of the key messages coming from the government's Jobs and Skills Summit in September. And this legislation, the passing of this legislation, is an example where this government has listened and taken action. Of course, for pensioners, uh, this is a win for them. For businesses, this is a win for them. And for the government, it demonstrates a clear ability to listen and to act. The member for Moncrief will cease interjecting. I give the call to the member for Hughes. My question is to the Minister for Small Business. Can the minister... just, just a moment. The member for Hughes will resume her seat and will reset the clock. The microphone is not on. I give the call to the member for Hughes. Can the minister advise whether there is an error in the industrial relations regulatory impact statement? And if so, can the minister advise of the correct figure? The Leader of the House is the minister responsible for that part of the question. So I will give him the call. Uh, thanks for it. But, yeah. Well, he hasn't made the point of order yet, so I'll allow him to. No, he's doing a point of order. Well, I said he's the responsible minister, so I'm asking him to take the point of order, and then I will hear the point of order, and then I will hear your point of order. So I call, I call the leader of the house. Just so you're clear, if I call the leader of the house in that capacity, he's doing the leader of the house. When he, I'm calling him for his full name, I'm calling him as the minister responsible. Give him the call. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, with the question that's been asked, uh, a regulatory impact statement has been referred to with no context as to what bill it was attached to. Uh, it's no context at all. Um, so I'm not yeah. sure how it can be addressed yeah. to any minister. So, um, if it is something relating to my portfolio, then there'd have to be more context. But I can't see how that's a question actually available to any minister. So you may resume, Ms. Seed. I may allow the member for Hughes to rephrase that question, but I'll hear from the manager of opposition business. Uh, well, just to assist the House, uh, Mr. Speaker, page 52 of the regulation impact statement for the uh, Fair Work, uh, stronger, secure jobs, stronger pay bill. The bill that has recently passed the Senate at uh, the House and is currently yeah. before the Senate. Page 52 of the regulation impact statement. All right. I may, you may resume your seat. I'm going to allow the member for Hughes to re rephrase the question and refer to the bill that she is referring to in her question. And I call the member for Hughes. My question is to the Minister for Small Business. Can the Minister advise whether there is an error in the industrial relations regulatory impact statement? If so, can the minister advise of the correct figure? That, I'll hear from the Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, can I, can I suggest that when a question is so obviously and deliberately not within the portfolio area of the minister it's being raised with, uh, that the question, rather than being re redirected, should simply be ruled out of order? On the point of order, I'll hear from the Leader of the Opposition. Well, Mr Speaker, uh, with, uh, you know, with real respect for my colleague opposite, uh, I think he's playing a little cute on this one. This issue has been quite contentious in the Senate already. Whether he's been conveyed that message or not, uh, I'd be very surprised if he hasn't. But the fact is, Mr Speaker, the question was put to the, small minister, to the Minister for Small Business. It relates to the provision within the regulatory impact statement that goes to small business impact, the 15,000, the medium size, the large size may, business. It is an obvious mistake you may that the minister your, should be aware of. You may resume and she your should seat. Order. I'm just going to ask for the House, the Minister for Industry. The Minister for Industry will cease interjecting. I call the Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker. To the point of order raised by the, the Leader of the Opposition, uh, he actually just gave the game away. He actually said, even if you add all the extra context, it's about a medium-sized business the question, not about the small business minister. So even if we accept everything he's just said, they've still got order. it wrong. They've still got it wrong. Order. So, 
There is no way in the world that that question is a valid question in the way they've tried to direct it. I'm to, to a, well, order. The House will come to order. I want to hear from the Leader of the Opposition. Well, Mr Speaker, I mean, is the argument now that the Small Business Minister can't answer a question in relation to medium-sized businesses? Is that the argument being put by the Leader of the House? I mean, how long does right. this protection racket resume, continue on for? Resume your seat. Resume your seat. To assist the House, I'm going to ask the... The Deputy Leader of the Opposition is not helping. To assist the House, I'm going to ask the member for Hughes to rephrase the question one more time. To assist the House, Minister for Cyber Security, so that the so that the House can deal with the issue. <laughs> the the prime order, members on my right, members members on my the member will resume her seat. The House will come to order. Members on my right, I'm trying to hear from the Prime Minister. The, the members on my right will cease interjecting. I'll call for the, give the call to the Prime Minister on a point of order. Order. The members on my right will cease interjecting. The member for Kingswood Smith is warned. Give the call to the Prime Minister. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Uh, past speakers have, at this embarrassing point, uh, just asked to move on. We should move on to the next question. I'm sure there's a member on this side yeah, to, order. Sort order. to do so. The order, members on my left, I want, to, I want to give the member for Hughes a fair go. She's a new member. I'm going to ask her, out of courtesy, out of the respect I have for her, to ask the question. If it is out of order, I will rule it so. I can't. The member for Lawler is warned. Give the call to the member for Hughes. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Small Business. Can the Minister advise whether there is an error in the Industrial Relations Regulatory Impact Statement, particularly under the Fair Work Legislation Amendment and particularly in relation to page 52 of that document? And if so, can the minister advise the correct figure of that error? Look, I'm going to rule the order. I'm going to rule the question out of order. No, order. I'm going to rule the question out of order. She's got time to rephrase it correctly, so it's directed either to the right minister or including the right information. Okay. Uh, on the point of order, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, it, look, in my, in my submission to you, Mr Speaker, I don't believe that you can rule the question out of order on the following basis. I want to hear from basis. the Leader of the Opposition. I'm making, order. I, have, I have the call, Mr Speaker. I'll make yeah, a point of I'm order. I'm just going to hear from the Leader of the Opposition and then I'll call the Prime Minister straight away. Order. The provision within the regulatory impact statement relates to small business. That's, that's, the, that's the section that is being referred to. So for your information, Mr Speaker, it's not, it's not beyond the remit of the minister. In fact, it's entirely within her portfolio responsibility. Now, if the Minister for Small Business can't answer a question that relates to the resume, financial resume, impact yep, of the legislation... Thank you. I'm on the point of order, the Leader of the House. Uh, it's on a different point of order, Mr Speaker. Is the member for Hughes even in her correct seat? That she'd have to be in to be able to get the call. That order, under the standing orders, members must be in their correct seats. Yeah. Well, I order order the. The Leader of the Opposition. Yeah, Mr. Well, to assist you, Mr Speaker, I've not heard a more petty point of order made in this place to start. Yeah. Order. We're going to resume your seat. Thank you. Yep. 
Uh, order. Members on my right. Members on, members on my right will cease interjecting. The member for Fremantle. The Leader of the Opposition I will give the call to. Speak to you, Mr Speaker. You have chosen to give the member the call. That can't be overruled by now some post-fact advice from the Leader of the House. All right. You, you made a judgment your to seat. give the call. Thank you. I understand your point of order. To assist the House, I would remind all members to, resi uh, to reside in their seat as per the standing orders. I'm going to move to the next question and we'll come back to the member for Hughes. I give the call to the member for Fraser. Yeah. My question is to the Treasurer. What insights were contained in the OECD's latest outlook for global growth and what does it mean for Australia? What are some of the economic challenges facing our country and how is the government responding? I give a call to the Treasurer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. With the member for Hughes's three attempts at that question, she's now asked more questions than the, than the Shadow <laughs> Treasurer has asked the Treasurer about the budget the handed down a month will ago continue with his in this place. Mr Speaker, thank you for the call uh, to the member for Fraser. Thank you for the question and for the economic firepower that you bring to this place. Uh, to Carol and her friends from the Sutherland Shire, thank you for the conversation last night and for being here in question time today to witness this pretty remarkable spectacle, frankly. Uh, Mr Speaker, overnight the OECD released an updated outlook for the economy and it contains more confronting news when it comes to global conditions. And what they said in their report is that the global economy is facing mounting challenges. Growth has lost momentum, high inflation is proving persistent, confidence has weakened and uncertainty is high. And the OECD said that the global economy is reeling from the largest energy no. crisis since the 1970s and that energy shock has pushed up inflation to levels not seen for many decades and it's lowering economic growth all around the world. And so the report shows, Mr Speaker, that the global economy has been reeling because of the biggest energy crisis since the 70s brought about by Russian aggression on my left in Ukraine. And, right. and that high and persistent inflation which has resulted has led to blunt and brutal application of monetary policy by the world's central banks and that's having an impact on the prospects for global growth as well. And we know on this side of the House, Mr Speaker, that the pressures on our economy are coming at us Minister from resources. around the world, but they are felt most acutely around the kitchen table. And so Australians are the paying a heavy price for Russian aggression, but they're also paying a heavy price for a wasted decade of missed opportunities and warped priorities and coalition incompetence when it comes to the economy. The types of incompetence that have left this country with an aged care crisis and skill shortages and an energy crisis and not enough to show for a trillion dollars in debt and wages which have been too stagnant in this country for far too long. And that's why the budget was all about making our budget more responsible and our, eco our economy more resilient to these international shocks. It's all about dealing with the aged care crisis and dealing with the skill shortage and making the budget more sustainable, investing in skills and childcare and all the other drivers of economic growth and participation in our economy. This side of the House, Mr Speaker, is absolutely determined to get wages moving again in our economy. One of the defining failures of those opposites period in office was the fact that ordinary working people were going backwards when government changed hands. And so we will make our budget more responsible, we will make our economy more resilient, and perhaps most importantly of all, Mr Speaker, the difference between this side of the House and that side of the House is we want to get decent wages and living standards for ordinary working people. They, they seek to diminish them at every opportunity. Order. Before I call the member for Hughes, I'd like to acknowledge in the House that present in the gallery today are the three winners from this year's My First Speech competition. On behalf of the House, I extend a very warm welcome to Savannah Rogers, Maya Weatherstone and Talia Moses. And I'd also, while we're on a roll, I'd also like to acknowledge Everell Compton AO, who's in the gallery today as well. A very warm welcome to you, Everell. And I give the call to the member for Hughes. My question is for the Minister for Small Business. I refer to page 52 of the regulation impact statement from the Fair Work Amendment Bill. In calculating the cost of multi-employer bargaining, the report states. 
$273,700 divided by 15.2 is $12,878 per business. Is the minister aware that that figure divided by 15.2 actually equals 18006 18006 or is this a mistake the government is deliberately trying to hide the significant costs which businesses are set to pay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to give the call to the minister. There was a question in there relating to her portfolio, and I give her the call. Thanks, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank the member for her question. Uh, as she would be aware, regulatory impact statements are prepared by the department responsible for that legislation. Order. That department members is the on department my left. of workplace relations, and the members minister on my responsible left will cease is over here. If you member want to direct Groom. the question to him. I give, I give the call order. The House, the House will come to order. The Leader of the Opposition, the Member for Casey, the Leader of the Nationals, when the House comes to order, I will hear, I will hear from the Member for Bean. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. What policies are being changed by the Albanese Labor government? to prioritise action on climate change, and what are the broader implications of this approach? Give the call to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Well, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I thank my honourable friend uh, for his question and for his leadership on matters of climate change. And we know on this side of the House, as other members know, that action on climate change is very urgent. We have had another reminder of that today in the report uh, released by the Minister for Industry and the Minister for the Environment, the State of the Climate Report, prepared by the, the CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology. And we, already, and we know from that report uh, that heat already kills more Australians than any other natural disaster. And we know already that we are adding one day extra of heat wave every five years. And that has terrible implications right across Australia, including the area I represent. Uh, many people don't have air conditioning, and many elderly people uh, can't deal with extra. Many elderly people can't deal with an extra day of heat wave, and it has heat wave, and it has very the severe health implications. England. Mr. Speaker, we know that if we don't act, the terrible bushfires that our country experienced in 2020 will be the average, will be the norm in the 2040s, and will be a good result by the 2060s if the world doesn't act to stop global warming. And that's why we are acting and acting urgently. I'm pleased to report to the House, for example, that today the other place, the Senate, has passed the final piece of legislation necessary for offshore wind in Australia, the final piece in the jigsaw puzzle, and I look forward to making further announcements about offshore wind in coming weeks. Very important announcements. I'm very confident that the Senate will pass our electric vehicle tax cut this week, Mr Speaker. No support from the opposition for a tax cut for electric vehicles, such is their prejudice, but other parties have worked with the government and we will pass that important legislation and electric vehicles will be cheaper for firms around the country. This is what we're doing, getting on with the job. I'm also pleased to report that my friend, the Assistant Treasurer, has introduced the Tax Laws Amendment Bill, which will replenish the funds necessary for rewiring the nation to improve transmission across our country, to build the transmission we need to get more renewable energy on. These are all important steps, Mr Speaker, that are necessary and vital, as we know, for Australia to act. I'm also pleased to inform the House that next week, next Thursday, on behalf of the government, I'll be delivering the nation's first climate change statement, Mr Speaker, as required under the Act we passed, the first climate act to pass in a decade, an important opportunity in which I will also be tabling Member the Climate Wannan. Change Authority's independent advice to the government and updated projections. This is what transparency is about, Mr Speaker. This is what progress is about, reporting to the House on progress, reporting to the House on challenges, reporting to the House on opportunities. I hope the House comes together, Mr Speaker, at that time, so we can all share policies on climate change that, that are necessary in this country, Member so the opposition Hume can update the, the House the on their policies and priorities, Mr Speaker, as we will do. This is an important moment for the House, for the country, the next step in dealing with the most important challenge we have of climate change. I give the call to the member for Parks. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government. I refer to warnings by domestic airlines that they will be forced to cut marginal flight routes and increase airfare prices 
as a result of the government's extreme industrial relations changes. Given regional families rely on these flight routes being accessible and affordable, can the minister guarantee there will be no impacts to regional flight routes or airfares from Labor's extreme industrial relations agenda? Give the call to the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government. Thank you very much. I'll uh, start answering the question and then I will ask the Minister for Industrial Relations, who's responsible both uh, for the legislation and the same job, same pay uh, policy, which in fact I suspect the member was uh, referring to. Uh, it has been terrific to see our airlines come back at strength. Uh, we're almost seeing 100 per cent of domestic demand coming back. Uh, that's uh, uh, very pleasing to see. Uh, I do note that you know, Qantas has become very profitable and had uh, we, the go previous government done what we suggested, actually provide JobKeeper with uh, an equity stake in Qantas, we'd actually be making quite a bit of money at the moment. Might have been something uh, that would be a very good idea. Uh, but I absolutely am conscious that uh, Qantas is in the building lobbying, as are a number of other businesses uh, at the moment. Uh, and can I assure you, our interest is getting wages moving and making sure that the services that are delivered right the way across the country and that the wages of regional people are actually benefiting from our industrial relations legislation. Will I ask my, I'll ask the minister. Give the call to the. Minister for Employment and Industrial Relations. Thanks so much. I don't know what someone has to do to get a question in this place when the, the, the portfolio appears to be of interest. It appear, but I don't know what it is. I don't know what it will take for those opposite to realise that it's not outrageous for the Australian workforce to want a share of profits that happen in Australia. It's not outrageous for the Australian workforce to see projects, to see businesses in Australia doing well and saying at the same time, why should they be constantly falling behind? There's nothing wrong with the Australian workforce believing that they should have a better chance of keeping up with what's happening in expenses in this country. On the point of order, I'll hear from the member for Parks. Uh, the point of order, Mr Speaker, is I asked for the impact on flight routes. I didn't ask the question about wage rates. I asked the impact on flight routes, and the previous minister or the current one hasn't answered that question. Resume your seat. Both ministers are in order. I'm listening carefully to their answers, and I give the call to the minister. Thanks so much. One of the words that was used in the question from recollection was the word extreme. I'll tell you what's extreme. Ten years of wages not moving is extreme. Ten years of Australians going further and further behind. That's extreme. Australian workers knowing right now, over the last 10 years, on my they left. have, in fact, now in real terms, earning less than what they were learning a decade ago. That's extreme. But that wasn't an accident. That was a deliberate design feature of how those opposite ran the economy. And they're onto it. They know the legislation will deal with it because the shadow treasurer's objection to the legislation is because it will get wages moving. That's his objection to it. I'll tell you what I want with flight routes. I want more Australians to be able to afford to be able to get on a plane. I want more Australians to be able to afford some of those discretionary expenses. Members on those the opposite members of know the title of the bill is what it will deliver, and that's what they oppose. They oppose secure jobs. They oppose better pay. We intend to deliver both. I give the call to the member for Pearce. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Industry and Science. What would the findings of the 2022 State of the Climate Report released today by the CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology? What role can our science and industry sectors play to reduce the impact of climate change? Give the call to the Minister for Industry uh, and Science. Thank you, Speaker. And I, I want to thank the, uh, the member for Pearce for that question, who I know is concerned about the issue and very keen to see us act. I just if I may, wanted to reflect. I was grateful you mentioned uh, former member Hale up there, who's spent more time in the House. This is a, may be a record for you, my friend, uh, <laughs> g given we had a similarly complicated relationship with 94A. Um, uh, going to the heart of the, going to the, heart of the matter, uh, uh, Minister Plibersek and I did release the seventh biennial report, uh, State uh, of the Climate 2022, uh, and it is disturbing reading to see 
uh, what we are seeing, and particularly the work that has been done by the CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology in being able to track what's happening in our climate and how, importantly, it affects our nation. Uh, it uh, uh, also, as it rightly says, provides an information, a source of information to improve decision making by governments, by businesses and by communities. And uh, notably, what uh, this report pointed out is that, the Australian cli that Australia's climate is warming at an increasing rate, at 1.47 degrees since records began over a century ago. Greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide at the highest concentrations seen on Earth in at least two million years, and sea surface temperatures rising over one degree since 1900. Now, in a nutshell, what that means is there's an increased risk of more fires, more flood, uh, more extreme heat more often. Uh, it also is showing that our oceans are getting warmer, more acidic, and snowfall, uh, based on the trend line since the 50s, is going in the wrong way. So this has, uh, I mean, I'm uh, informing the House as a science minister, but also uh, in terms of raising the issues on the impact on industry, from fisheries through to tourism. So it's a, it's a big concern. Now, uh, the concern is one thing. We have an ability to act. Uh, all of us in being able to respond and also to prepare in particular industry. And there's a role to play. If you're a household that wants to use energy more efficiently, there's a job for you. If there's industry that wants to use energy less, there's certainly a role for you. If you're in science and research and want to think of new ways to do things more efficiently, there is a job for you. And in particular, uh, we are about to release uh, the legislation around our National Reconstruction Fund and contained within it is uh, $3 billion worth uh, of uh, capital that will be available for people who want to manufacture the type of technology and, uh, and equipment, low emissions technology, that can make, and renewables, that can make a difference. And to make sure that the technology we think of here gets made here. And, and in times past, we had foregone that opportunity. We can act as one on this. It just takes a government to take the science seriously, to organise, to work with business and the community to make all of that happen. Yeah. Give the call to the member for Curtin. My question is to the Attorney General. The UN has expressed concern about the very low age of criminal responsibility in Australia. In WA, we're currently locking kids up in an adult prison. Will you make public the final report prepared in 2020 by the Council of Attorneys General that allegedly shows the majority of state and territory attorneys general were in favour of raising the age of cr criminal responsibility to 14 years? Give the call to the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Curtin for her question. Uh, the report that the member has mentioned, a report uh, authorised by the Western Australian Government um, was the product of a form the former meeting of Attorneys General. Sorry for making the precise distinction. The decision not to release it was made under the previous government. The paper was not written by the Commonwealth Government, so there are steps that have to be taken in order for it to be released. I've instructed my department to include the release of the paper as an item for decision at the next meeting of the Standing Council of Attorneys General, which met for the first time on the 12th of August this year. It was actually the first time that there's been a physical meeting of Attorneys General for some three years. And the former structure of the former government of a meeting of Attorneys General was the one responsible for this paper. So um, we'll wait for that next meeting of the Standing Council of Attorneys General when the release of the paper will be discussed. But I do appreciate the member's interest in this question of the minimum age of criminal responsibility. Um, where I am working closely with state and territory counterparts through the Standing Council of Attorneys member General Aston. to develop proposals about the minimum age of criminal responsibility. I'm also working closely with the Minister for Indigenous Australians to address the very serious issue of overrepresentation of First Nations children in the criminal justice system, consistent with the obligations of all governments under the National Agreement on Closing the Gap. Uh, at that meeting on 12 August, all Attorneys General agreed that an officials working group will continue to develop a proposal to increase the minimum age of criminal responsibility. 
uh, paying particular attention to that overrepresentation of First Nations children. Um, the next meeting will be in December of 2022, and I note that the progress, that some progress in this has already been made, because the government of the Northern Territory has introduced a bill already, uh, and there is now a bill before the Legislative Assembly of the Northern Territory to raise the age of communal responsibility. Give a call to the member for Colwell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations. How will the Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill lift wages for low and middle income earners, and has the misinformation stopped? Give the call to the Minister for Employment, Workplace Relations, and Minister for the Arts. Thanks so much, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the member for Corwell uh, for the question. And I say to the member for Corwell, I wish the misinformation had stopped. I, I wish it had, but I reckon it's not about to. I reckon it's going to keep coming. We, we've, we've heard a bit. Uh, we. Member we had Deakin only this morning interjecting. it was an interview uh, from, from none other than the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, uh, where uh, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition was asked to, uh, about the Senate Committee report that came out yesterday. And members will be aware the Senate Committee has recommended change in the definition of small business uh, from 15 to 20. Uh, the government's considering, government's considering that change. And the words this the morning, of opposition business. The words this morning from uh, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, uh, interviewed on Sky News by Peter Stefanovic, were these. Uh, they did make that very modest change, lifting 15 to 20, but that's not going to make a difference. Not going to make a difference for 56, Let me the, tell the you the difference it makes. The opposition will cease if the government does accept that recommendation from the Senate, it means 97.5% of Australian businesses are excluded from, the, from that stream. Two and a half million businesses would be excluded from that stream. That's a pretty big difference. That's a pretty significant difference. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition will cease interjecting. If you... <laughs> I've got to say, the it's a fair continue. call. Like if I were the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, anyone someone quoted me, I'd say, oh, I'm being misrepresented. <laughs> because there is nothing more dangerous for the integrity and reputation of the Deputy Leader of the Opposition than her own words. And the rest of the team is following suit, because, because we even had—and I've looked at this one as well from the member for Hughes, who we've heard from a, a number of times today—and the member for Hughes has said in, in the debate in this House, there is no evidence that these reforms will actually deliver higher wages. Well, let's go to the architect of low wages being a deliberate design feature, and let's look at what the now head of the OECD is saying about multi-employer bargaining. 2020 OECD report said multi-employment agreements, multi-employer agreements are, quote, necessary to negotiate targeted raises in female-dominated and low-paid sectors. 2019 report, multi-employer arrangements have, quote, higher employment, lower unemployment, a better integration of vulnerable groups and less wage inequality. Member for Hume the real arguments have come, though, from the member for Longman, who has taken up on Senator Cash's sense of nuance to say, we know that socialist and communist governments' underlying ideology is to control people's lives, and this legislation feeds into that ideology. All the calm over there is just Order, breathtaking. On my left. Wages need to get moving. This legislation the will do it. The time has expired. The member for Longman will cease interjecting. I'll give the call so I can hear from the member for Herbert. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Before the election, Labor promised to reduce power prices on at least 97 occasions. But before the election, Labor was completely silent about signing up Australia to a $2 trillion UN fund to send money to countries all around the world. Why is the government sending taxpayers' money offshore while taking no action to reduce power bills of struggling Australian families? Give the call to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. The member for Deakin and the member for Aston, there is far too much noise in that corner of the world. Oh, fix up. We've just cease interjecting. The minister has not begun answering the question. He's fair game once he starts, but can we just have silence before the minister begins? And the leader of the opposition is not helping. So I He's give obsessed. the 
I give the minister the call. <laughs> I give the minister the call. Order well, th on my left. To talk through some of this <laughs> th thanks, Mr. Speaker. There's a lot. There's a lot in that question, and a lot I could talk about. But I'll deal with the latter part of the honourable member's question, because on this side of the house, we do believe in engaging on how to deal with the impacts of climate change here and around the world. That's what we believe in. We believe in doing that domestically, and we believe in doing that internationally. And that's what we were doing last week at the COP meeting. Uh, we believe that this is an important security issue in our region as well, in the Pacific and in Southeast Asia. That's what we believe. There is a genuine difference of view, uh, it appears, between the opposition and the government on this question. We believe in engaging in the international conversation. We believe in shaping that conversation. That's what we were doing last week, negotiating, talking to the Pacific, talking to developed countries, talking about good design, talking about ensuring that wealthy countries that weren't wealthy in 1992 are making a contribution, making sure that the, uh, that the loss and damage Payments are focused on the most vulnerable countries, countries in our region, countries in our region like Tuvalu, Vanuatu, and Samoa. Countries like that, Mr. Speaker. That's what we believe. Members on our, we believe on that left, the countries in our region, like Fiji, which is estimated to lose 5% of their GDP every year due to climate change-induced natural disasters, have a right to a seat at the table. And we believe it's in our interest to engage with them. And if the opposition has an alternative view, I invite them to outline it. Mr. Speaker, they say that this is not a conversation we should be involved in. They say we should not be talking uh, at the COP and not talking to Pacific Member nations. Green. I invite the, the Leader of the Opposition, Mr. Speaker, on this topic. He's the alternative Prime Minister of this country. It will be, if he's successful, it would be his role to be the chief diplomat of the nation, Mr. Speaker. I would invite him today to invite the High Commissioners and Ambassadors of the Pacific to hear why he doesn't think we should be engaged in this conversation. Invite them all in and let him explain that we don't th he thinks our country should have no role in helping the Pacific. The Leader of the Opposition could wave, in a, wave in a few jokes to his discourse Mr. Speaker, about climate Member change Herbert, and the Pacific. The he, if he, if he wants warned. to do that, he should explain that. He should explain to the Pakistani community, which I've done. I've met with the Pakistani leaders about the $30 billion worth of damage to their economy. He should explain that that's not our concern. We have no interest in this matter. If this is his role, if this is his approach, he should explain it to the Australian people. Our view is clear. We will engage, we will be involved, we will be constructive players in climate debates because Australia is back at the table after 10 long years. The House comes to order. I'll hear from the member for Werriwa. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. How will the National Anti-Corruption Commission prevent corruption from occurring at a federal level? I'll give the call to the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for Werriwa for her question. Corruption has a corrosive impact. On society. It undermines democracy, it erodes public trust in government. The Albanese government knows that tackling corruption means more than just investigating corruption, it means working to prevent corruption from occurring in the first place. The Australian people don't just want to see corrupt activity being caught after it happens, they also want standards to be improved so they have confidence that corruption is not occurring in the first place. That's why the National Anti-Corruption Commission will be tasked with education and prevention functions. It's an aspect of our proposed new body, which has perhaps not been as prominent in public discussion as the investigation functions, but is just as important. The Commission will be required to provide guidance and information to support the public sector to identify and address vulnerabilities to corruption. It will educate the public sector and raise awareness of corruption risks and how to actively take steps to prevent them. The Commission will be able to hold public inquiries into corruption risks and vulnerabilities. It will be tasked with providing broad public education about its role, about corruption risks and avenues to report corrupt conduct. That work will be informed by the insights that the Commission draws from its investigations and the intelligence that it collects about corruption. And in this way, the Commission will be able to prevent corruption from happening in the first place. The Australian people sent a very clear message at the last election. They want a national anti-corruption commission without delay. They want a national anti-corruption commission with teeth.
They saw that the former national Liberal government, Liberal National Government, failed to deliver on the promise that was made by the former Prime Minister and the former Attorney General in December of 2018 failed to establish a seat. The Manager of Opposition on a point of order. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, on relevance, uh, you have previously directed ministers back to the terms of the question, uh, and that ought to happen here, because there was no reference to the previous government in the question. Order. Members on my right, the question was specific about how the NAC will prevent corruption occurring at the federal level. I'll give some tolerance to the minister, but I'll ask him to return back to the question. Uh, let's, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Let's be clear about this. The Australian people voted at the last election for a government that had an actual plan and an actual commitment to deliver a national anti-corruption commission. The Albanese government is delivering on its promise to tackle corruption and restore trust and integrity to public institutions. I take this seriously. The Albanese government takes this seriously. It's time to get this done. Give a call to the member for Fowler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. I'm sure that many residents in Western Sydney and across Australia are awaiting um, their electricity bills with trepidation. With Christmas just about four weeks away, families are feeling the pinch as they spent more on food, petrol, which has increased, and household bills, on top of saving money to buy presents for their loved ones. You have said you will announce, and I quote, temporary, meaningful, uh, sensible regulations to ease the energy crisis. What is the date the government will announce these, these new measures? Give the call to the Treasurer. Yeah, thank you very much to the member for Fowler for her question uh, and for her interest and obviously for uh, the way that she's engaged on these issues for some time now. Uh, the reason that we uh, are prepared to make that uh, temporary, meaningful, responsible intervention in these markets uh, between now and the end of the year uh, is because we do think it's unacceptable uh, the sorts of uh, price rises which are anticipated by the Treasury uh, and uh, contained in the budget papers that I released about a month ago. Uh, the Australian people are paying a very hefty price for Russian Petrie. aggression in Ukraine. Uh, and for a decade of coalition incompetence when it comes to energy markets. Uh, and the reality is, the reality is, and the reality is that for the failures Hume. of the member for Hume and others on that side of the House mean that we are more vulnerable to these international shocks in global energy markets than we should be. And that's because over the course of dejecting. a decade, those opposite took more capacity out of the energy markets than they put in, and that made us more vulnerable. And so that's how we find ourselves. That's how the we find ourselves Hume in the warned. position that we're in. That's how we find ourselves in the position that we're in, and it is unacceptable. Uh, and that's why I am working closely with the industry minister, the resources minister, the energy minister, the prime minister, the trade minister, and others uh, to find a way. Uh, to intervene in these markets in a meaningful way, in a temporary way and in a responsible way. Uh, and to those, or, or to the those opposite... The, the Treasurer will to those resume his seat. The, the Treasurer will resume his seat. The, just for a moment. Member Fowler, I'll give her the call on a point of order. Um, treasurer, I just want a date, if it's possible. So that... that <laughs> order... That wasn't a point of order, but you were seeking relevance. I just invite the Treasurer in his remaining one minute and ten seconds to conclude his answer regarding the member for Fowler's question. Thank you, the member for Fowler. We will, uh, we will progress this work as quickly as we can, and we will make an announcement before the end of the year. Give the call to the member for Lawler. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Trade and Tourism. Last night, legislation to implement free trade agreements with India and the United Kingdom passed the Parliament. How will these free trade agreements benefit Australian businesses and workers and support the Albanese Labor government's trade diversification strategy? Give the call to the Minister representing the Minister for Trade and Tourism. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the member for Lawler for her question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Albanese Labor government believes in free, fair, and open trade. We know more trade means more export opportunities for Australian businesses and more high-paying jobs for Australian workers. One in four Australian jobs are related to trade, and jobs in export industries pay five percent more than jobs uh, and across the national average income. That is why this government worked so hard over the last six months to successfully pass legislation to implement Order. these Members on my trade left. agreements with India and the United Kingdom just last night. This the is a triumph Herbert. for Australian exporters and for Australia's trade diversification strategy. The Australia-India Economic Cooperation and, Cooperation and Trade Agreement will deliver immediate benefits for Australia. Tariffs will be eliminated on 90 per cent of Australian goods exported to India by value and significantly reduced on additional products such as wine. Our services exports from India, worth $5 billion in 2021, will benefit from improved predictability the and access. Will cease and this trade agreement presents incredible opportunities for Australian businesses to reach 1.4 billion consumers in the world's fastest growing economy with a GDP of 4.3 trillion Australian dollars, and that's especially in my portfolio of resources. And indeed, I met with my Indian counterpart, Minister Joshi, earlier this year to strengthen cooperation on the development of critical mineral projects and supply chains, uh, even in my electorate uh, in uh, Kwanana. The UK Australia Free Trade Agreement will deepen our already strong economic relationships with the UK, offering even more opportunities for our businesses to diversify our markets. It will cut tariffs on over 99 per cent of Australian Remember goods Deacon, exports to we'll the UK. Or, or we'll leave the These chamber. agreements mean more Aussie exports uh, and more jobs in ag agriculture, uh, in wine, in mining and critical minerals, education services, tourism, healthcare, renewable energy exports and technology. I want to acknowledge the efforts of former uh, Ministers for Trade, Senator Birmingham uh, and the member for Wannan. The commencement, the commencement of negotiations for free trade agreements go over many years, different terms of government and withstand changes in government. The Indian Free Trade Agreement was commenced under Labor's Members Julia Gillard left, as Prime ejecting. Minister and it is Labor's Trade Minister, Senator Don Farrell and the Albanese Labor government that has delivered the legislation for the India Agreement and the UK Free Trade Agreement. Labor does, we help you get our chapter through this parliament, don't you forget that either. And we started negotiations for that as well. That was also started under Prime Minister Gillard. So you need to know, and the people of Australia need to know, Labor supports free trade agreements. We always have and we always will. Order. When the House, House comes to order, I'll hear from the member for Fisher. <laughs> member Page. Member Fisher. Thanks, Speaker. My question goes to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, the Alex Surf Club, of which I'm a proud member, on the beautiful Sunshine Coast, will be forced to pay $250,000 more for electricity next year compared to this year. When can the Alex Surf Club see the promised $275 cut to their power bills? Call to the, to the Prime Minister. I'll just, start, I'll just start very quickly by giving a shout out to the Alex Surf Club. I was very pleased. I was very pleased to be there and to meet uh, and, and, and to meet the uh, heads of the Alex Surf Club. And we were no, I was at Alexandra Heads Surf Club, and we, we did we did a press conference there. See, I know Queensland. Alexandra Heads is different from Marucci Dog. Two different events, two different places, a bit like Yepin, a bit like Yepin and Yapoon. Two different places. But I asked the, uh, the Minister for Energy to respond. Call the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Members on my left will cease interjecting. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for his question. And uh, we are very concerned about the impact on energy prices of the global energy crisis. Uh, caused by, caused by the, Ukraine, the war in Ukraine. Oh, honourable members opposite interject, the Shadow Treasury interjects. Uh, uh, he had a different view prior to the election. He had a different view prior to the election. Prior to the election, he was asked about Ukraine and what does it mean for the world's gas supply. And the member for Hume said, "Well, obviously, it's putting upward pressure on oil and gas prices around the world, Mr. Speaker." That's what he said. 
And then we also had, uh, then we also had the other energy minister in the uh, government. The member for Hume will cease interjecting. Who said? But in the last 12 months, we've seen Russia invade Ukraine, and to think that's not going to have an impact, particularly on energy prices and supply chains and disrupt the economy, well, I think that would be unfair. I don't think that would be realistic. That was the other energy minister, who was also prime minister, a member for Cook, but I, I'm not sure in what capacity he was talking, Mr. Speaker. But that was his view, and he was he was actually correct, Mr. Speaker, at that point. Because member for we Fisher will cease the projecting. impact on the surf club. We understand the impact on residents. Member for Lindsay. We understand the impact on industry. That's why. That's why we will not stand by and watch this uh, play out. We will not stand by and watch the fact that thermal coal was selling at $286 a tonne in December 21 and is now selling at $505.15 a tonne, Mr Speaker. That's going to flow through unless the government takes action. Gas is selling, was selling for $11.56 a gigajoule in December. Today it's $18.67. This is what is driving the energy price rise, as the, as the uh, International Energy Agency has made clear right around the world, Mr. Speaker. They said just last the week, 90 per cent, 90 per cent of the upward pressure on electricity costs around the world is coming from fossil fuels, coal, coal and gas, Mr. Speaker. That's what the International Energy Agency says. So, of course, Mr. Speaker, governments around the world, conservative, left-leaning governments all around the world, are dealing with this crisis and responding just as this government is assiduously working through the issues and will respond and will not stand by and let this impact on Australian households and businesses. Call to the member for Holt. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Immigration, Citizenship and Multicultural Affairs. How is the Albanese Labor government cleaning up the visa backlog mess left behind by the former government? Call to the Minister for Immigration, Citizenship and multicultural affairs. Thank you, Speaker. And I thank the member for Holt for her question. The outstanding member for Holt, as the uh, Minister for Early Childhood Education, reminds me. I thank her for her question and her deep interest in this. And for you, for you, member for Aston, to find this funny is absolutely extraordinary. Because you played a major role in creating the this Aston backlog. Will cease you played a major role, member for Aston, in creating this backlog. Although, of course, you were not alone. Now, when we arrived in government, because of the failures of the previous government, there were almost a million visa applications waiting to be processed. The result, the result of a decade of cruelty and a decade of neglect. These backlogs were, were choking our immigration system, choking our economy too. And members opposite might want to think about the terrible impact on small business of this backlog. The terrible impact of small business, a matter they might want to think about. But they should also think about the impact on our society as a multicultural nation. And fixing this mess, everyone should be clear, is an urgent task of this government. And I'm pleased to advise the House that the backlog is now under 740,000. Because we have engaged more than 300 new staff working in roles supporting visa processing. More staff are being onboarded. Now, I'm going to be clear. We can't clear this backlog overnight, but we are seeing results. We have seen 3.4 million visas processed, Mr. Speaker. 3.4 million visas finalised since the 1st of June, and we are on track to hit our target of 600,000 applications on hand by the end of the year, creating certainty for businesses and certainty for families. Because this government understands how important family connections are. In our country, where one in two Australians are born overseas or have a parent born overseas, now since being elected, we've made a series of changes to make sure that loved ones can once again spend time together. Spend time together in this country, in our country. We've streamlined processing policies whilst keeping integrity uh, mechanisms in check. And we will replace Ministerial Direction 80, simplifying the prioritisation system for family visa applications. And I've been made aware since becoming Minister of numerous applications for partner visas that have been waiting for finalisation since 2013. Ten years! Ten years that Australian citizens and permanent residents have been separated from their young ones. And in fact, just two days ago, we finalised a case, a case that had been on the books for nine years. Nine years of people being separated from their loved ones, including in many cases their children. These are the real human consequences of a decade of neglect. Yeah. 
taking the call to the Prime Minister. Thanks, Mr Speaker. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper.